Here to the morning worship service at the Bremen Church of Christ. We do have visitors with us. We're always glad to host visitors, of course. For those that are members and visitors alike, we would invite you to take just a moment, fill out an attendance card, pass that to the center aisle. We'll collect that at the close of our service so that we may have a record of your visit here with us today. The Bremen Church meets every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock on Sunday evenings, and then 7 on Wednesdays for our midweek Bible study. We're so happy to have each of you here with us to participate in our worship services today. Brother Martin Higley will lead our minds in song service this morning. He's selected number 719, 719 is our first song. If you wish to turn to that and be ready, watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother Ricky Spake will lead our minds in prayer, and Brother Stephen Higley will conclude our services this morning in prayer at that time. Brother John McDaniel is not feeling well. He's at home. We wish him speedy recovery. But Brother Martin will be leading our song service this morning. You may have also noticed that uh, the building is in somewhat of disarray. We are spending a good bit of time in renovating the restroom facilities in the foyer. We do have restrooms in other places of the building, of course, and if you have need of that, we'd ask you to go down this area here, and the signs will direct you to the restroom facilities at the back of the fellowship hall or underneath the uh, classrooms here in the basement as well. But um, bear with us. We're hopeful of having this done by um, hopefully this Sunday and two more will be done, but hopefully that will be the plan, but that is the way we have it planned at this time. We had several that were here yesterday to help us in the demolition efforts. We're all thankful for everything that's been done to this point. There is some more work to be done, so if you wish to help us in that, Brother Robert Edwards is spearheading that effort, and we're thankful for him for doing so. Sister Lee Spade continues at uh, room 366 in Carrollton. You're asked to remember her again, as I mentioned, Brother John McDaniel not feeling well as at home. We're also glad to see Richard and Shirley able to be here with us this morning as well. We extend our sympathy to the family of Ed Shadricks and his passing. Brother Shadwick's passed away yesterday. Here are the uh, plans. The visitation will be tomorrow night from 5 to 8 p.m. at High Tower Funeral Home in Bremen. The funeral will be here at this building at the Bremen Church of Christ Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. Brother Shadwick's funeral here at the building Tuesday morning, 11 a.m. For those who wish to take food for the family, you can take that to the Family Care Center at Hightower by lunchtime, thereabouts. So they'll feed the family at the Family Care Center at Hightower Funeral Home after the funeral. But again, the funeral will be here at this building Tuesday at 11 a.m. Are there others that we should mention? Elders, we're looking forward to uh, meeting the deacons today at 4 o'clock, so hopefully the deacons have made preparation for planning that we can look forward to for planning our budget for next year, but that will begin at 4 o'clock this afternoon, and we look forward to seeing you at that time. The Youth Devo at the home of the Hodges is still planned for tonight. After the evening service, the van will go, be back here at 8.45 p.m. Uh, each of the youngins that are going are asked to bring $3 to help to fray, to fray the cost of the pizza. The boys are asked to bring drinks, and the girls are asked to bring desserts. But that's the youth devotional tonight after the evening worship service at the home of Chris and Stephanie Hodges. Group 3 and the Good Samaritans are joining together to host the Parents' Night Out event. That will be Saturday, November the 29th from 4 to 8 p.m. If you're uh, going to go and bring your kids here, please sign the list in the foyer if you plan to participate. Again, our holiday party is scheduled for Saturday, December the 13th, before 30, beginning here at the building in the Fellowship Hall. It will be catered by Billy Bob's. The cost is $9.50 each. Please give your money to Mark as soon as possible. If you're writing a check, bring, make it out to the Bremen Church of Christ. Children are welcome to bring a Happy Meal from their favorite restaurant if they so desire. Would you bow with me, please? Thank you, Father, for the many blessings of life. Thank you for sparing our lives to this hour that we have the opportunity to worship Thee. Father, may we recognize our responsibility and our privilege here to worship Thee in spirit and in truth. May our endeavors prove pleasing in Your sight. 
Father, forgive us of anything amiss in our lives so that we may worship Thee acceptably, stand pure and clean. May we edify one another in our efforts today. Father, we're mindful of those that we've mentioned this morning specifically in our prayer. We're also glad to see Sister Joan Thurman with us here today who's been experiencing some health difficulties. Father, we're mindful of the Shadricks family at this time and their bereavement. May they cast their cares upon you and may they draw strength from us as we support them in their time of trial. Father, be with those that have a public part in our worship this morning. May they prepare themselves in such a way that they can lead us as you desire and we can gain great benefit from it. Continue to watch over and care for us, Father, as we travel during this holiday season. We're thankful for that and the time that it allows for families to gather, but may they realize what's most important in their lives, putting you first in all things. Be with us through the remainder of this service, Father, in whatever future life you see best for us. For this is our humble prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue our worship now and stand and sing number 719. Preparation of the Lord's Supper, let's turn to number 265. We're saying this before the Lord's Supper. 265. <clears throat>
Let us pray. Dear Father, we are so thankful that you sent your son, Jesus, down to this earth to seek and save the lost and to die on that cruel cross at Calvary so we as Christians might have everlasting life. Dear Father, bless this bread which represents his body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did we overlook anyone? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for this fruit of the vine, this, the emblem of Your Son's blood that was shed on that cross for our sins. Thankful, Lord, that He had the mindset to see that Your will be done and be that perfect sacrifice for us. Pray that as we partake, we do so in a worthy manner that we do this in remembrance of him. In Jesus' name, amen.
Was anyone overlooked in the serving of the cup? This concludes the Lord's Supper. This time we'll give back a portion of what we receive. <clears throat> Let us pray. Dear Father, we're so thankful for all the material blessings that you give us. Thank you for our help. Dear Father, help us to give back with a cheerful heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Number 439. <clears throat> 439. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength. For the prayer number 246, 246. We're saying the first and fourth verse, 246. <clears throat> Tis the blessed hour of prayer when our hearts slowly bend and we gather to Jesus, our Savior and friend. If we come to him in faith, 
his protection to Let's pray. Dear God, we're thankful for this opportunity that we have this morning to come out here and learn more about your word. We're thankful for the night's rest. We're thankful that everything's as well with us as it is. Pray that you'll continue to be with this congregation as we strive to please you. Thankful for the elders. Thank you for Brother Chad and his family. Thank you for every person that makes up this congregation. Pray that you'll continue to be with us thankful that Jesus paid it all. Without him going to the cross, we would have no hope. Heavenly Father, we pray for those that are sick. We pray that you'll bless them and help them to get well. We pray for the doctors and nurses that they will continue to find new ways to treat people and make them well. We also pray for those at this time that are bereaved. We pray that you'll be with the Shadricks family and bless them in their time of bereavement. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'll continue to be with us all every day in our everyday walks of life. As we go out into the world, we pray that we will be good examples to others. Also, Heavenly Father, that we confess to you that we are sinners, that we do things from time to time that uh, cause us to stumble and fall, and we pray that you'll, we will ever be mindful of these things and uh, repent of these and make it right. We're thankful for the gospel. We're thankful for the Bible. Uh, pray that we will read our Bibles and uh, continue to strive to go to heaven. Go with us through the remainder of this service and on through whatever future life you see fit to give us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're at mark number 174. We're saying this as an invitation to him after the lesson this morning. 174. If we'd stand and turn number 176, we're saying this before our lesson. 176. <clears throat> Praise the Lord, he has.
Good to see everyone this morning. We are continuing with our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount. We noticed last week that Jesus, he mentioned that he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill the law. And we closed with verse 20 of chapter 5, where Jesus tells us and, and them that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, <clears throat> you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Of course, the kingdom of heaven is a phrase that's used a lot in the New Testament. Many times it means the church. Uh, many times it means heaven. You have to look at the context. Here, he's talking about the church because he's talking about the coming kingdom. Now, sometimes people will say, well, the kingdom and the church are two different things. The kingdom hasn't come yet. But we know biblically it has. Uh, in fact, in Colossians 1, 13, Peter, uh, Paul, we've been studying 2 Peter this morning. I got Peter on the brain, I guess. But uh, Paul says, you've been translated. He's writing to Christians. He says, you've been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. So we know the kingdom and the church are the same thing. And Jesus talks about it in his ministry. It's at hand. Uh, it's, a, it's about to happen. It's close at hand. Uh, Jesus preached that often. John the Baptist preached that often. So the kingdom of heaven here is the church. Jesus says, if your righteousness doesn't exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you, you can't enter into the kingdom of heaven or the church. He's going to, in the next several verses of Matthew chapter 5, expound on that, what it means to have your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Understand that to... I don't know if I'd say to everyone, but by and large, to the people, this would be a pretty shocking statement because the scribes and the Pharisees were viewed as the, the holy ones. They were the really religious people, and they were the leaders, and a lot of the people, uh, the, the masses of the Jews viewed them as, I mean, exceed their righteousness? How can anybody accomplish that? I mean, these are the most righteous people among the Jewish folk. And Jesus is going to point out, no, they're not at all. And he's going to at least six times, or, or six times, in the next several verses going on to the, to the end of chapter 5, he's going to say, you have heard, and he'll say something, and then he'll say, but I say unto you. And he's not really, he's, he's not saying something new. He, he's expounding on the law but what he's pointing out in each case is that what they focused on, those scribes and Pharisees, was an outward, visible manifestation. So that, indeed, they appear to the masses to look holy, to look righteous, and very religious, and pious. And Jesus is pointing out, they're not at all. And so he says, you've got to exceed this obsession with the outward appearance, how it looks. That's not to say that we should just walk around and say, well, I don't care how uh, anything looks to anybody. But they were so caught up in that, and you'll see that as we go through these things. They were so caught up in that, they didn't care about the inside. Their heart was corrupt. And Jesus says, we, we're going to have to fix that if we want to enter into his church, his kingdom. So that's what he begins expounding on in verse 21. And, you know, I'm... I struggled with how to break this up because six times Jesus says, you have heard, but I say unto you. And, and a six-point sermon, just there's no way. We, we could study that for a while if we wanted to be here pretty late. But uh, at the same time, I didn't want to just do, break it up and do every single one individually. And so uh, I'm going to do two this week, and I'm going to look. I think we can finish the next. I'm, I'm still looking at it, seeing if I can uh, get that in because I want to try to get it all into the time that we have Allotted. But let's look at two of these this morning. We're going to look at disputes. He's going to deal with disputes in verses 21 to 26. Then he's going to deal with desires in verses 27 to 30. Notice, first of all, dealing with the disputes, he, he talks about here a false interpretation that they have. But verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now sometimes he's going to say what their interpretation of the law was or, or their uh, tradition stated. But here he's stating what the law says. You've heard that it was said by them of old time. Well, that goes back to the law of Moses. Thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But here's the thing. 
uh, there, there's an outward observation here. And again, that's, that's their obsession. That's their forte is outward appearances. There's an outward observation, but they had reduced this command, thou shalt not kill, just to a judicial matter. I mean, it's just taken down to something that's a, a judicial matter. That's all they're thinking of. Now, keep in mind, thou shalt not kill, and we're not going to go into this in depth, but just, just by way of reminder, all murder is killing, but not all killing is murder. The law said thou shalt not kill in the sense of don't, don't murder. There were numerous crimes under the law of Moses that demanded capital punishment. Uh, so just, just bear that in mind. And Paul even said under the new, new covenant time, when he's standing before a Roman official, he says, if I've done anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. Uh, Paul wrote that the government bears not the sword in vain. I heard one preacher say the sword's not for giving spankings. <laughs> uh, so, you know, there are times when God authorizes capital punishment. That's not what, what's being discussed. But they reduced it just to a judicial matter. You, you, you kill and you're going to be in danger of the judgment. But they're, they're not considering the inward spirit of the law, so to speak. In other words, the heart matters. John is going to reiterate this in 1 John 3, 15, when he says, whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And that's the idea. You, you hate your brother in your heart. It's like you have killed him. And, of course, there's another type of murder, I guess we could call it, that is not a physical murder, and that's what we sometimes call character assassination. And sometimes people get into that. They, they try to destroy another's character. But, but they're, they're outwardly observing the law. They're not considering the inward. And that's what Jesus is getting to the root of here with this false interpretation that they have. And then he's going to give a fuller explanation, verse 22. <clears throat> he says, I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Rekha shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. People get hung up sometimes on, on the words here, especially that word reka, and it's a nearly untranslatable word. And it, 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 I don't know that we could nail it down to just one definition. It would be kind of like uh, calling someone worthless, uh, a bumbling idiot, or something to that, that effect. It's just really an insulting term. And just, just notice a few things here commenting on this verse. <clears throat> there, there's anger that is felt. Uh, to be angry without a cause is wrong. Now, sometimes we're going to be angry and there is a cause. In fact, Paul says, Ephesians 4.26, be ye angry and sin not. So it's not wrong just to be angry. But being angry at our brother without a cause, that's, that's what he's dealing, dealing with here. Getting just anger for no reason, just not liking somebody. And then, of course, you have anger expressed. It's hard to feel anger for very long without expressing it, right? So the anger expressed, and, and again, the focus is not on the words here per se. You know, sometimes when we were younger and I was growing up, of course, I, I grew up with Christian parents, and sometimes in the youth group, you know, it'd be a, a big, you know, <gasps> if somebody said fool, you know, like you just, you, you uttered the worst word, you know, now you're in danger of hellfire. Well, you know, it's the spirit in which these words are used. That's what the focus is on. It's not necessarily the word you choose because you could call somebody a different word but have the same attitude, the same spirit in which you're using that and it'll be equally damnable by the Lord. He's talking about just hating someone. I don't like you and I'm speaking contemptibly to you. We might even use the expression in the South, talking down your nose to someone, you know, looking down on them, that, that kind of thing. That's what he's dealing with here, this, this expression of anger. And then anger judged, you know, we, we need to understand we're going to give an account. Now, Jesus talked about in Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that men shall speak, they'll give an account thereof in the day of judgment. Ecclesiastes eleven nine 9 talks about rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth and walk in the ways of thy heart and the sight of thine eyes. But he says, but know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Romans 14, 12 says very clearly, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I need to understand that unrighteous anger or, or anger that I let go to the point of sin, it's going to be judged, and I need to be aware of that. And if, I've, if I'm guilty of that, I need to make it right. And I need to stay away from it if I'm not, because anger is certainly going to be judged by the Lord. And then we could classify anger. 
I wish we had more time to talk about this because this, this is one of the more interesting studies in the New Testament. There, there are classifications that we could give of anger. Uh, just, just very quickly, notice these, these classifications. There is what we might call rage, just, just blowing up, flying off the handle, we might say. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 9, the wise man says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. Uh, that's that quick, uh, you know, sometimes I might even say, i got a short temper. And somebody says something and you just snap back at them. That would be uh, what we would call rage. Then there is resentment, Ecclesiastes 7, 9, the last part of that verse. Uh, he says, be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of fools. Anger is, is settled is the idea. It, it's there in, in the bosom or the heart of a fool. In, in other words, anger just, it abides there. We, we would call this resentment, holding a grudge, something of that effect. Uh, you, you hold on to it. It's not just a quick explosive anger where, you know, you're angry, you, you maybe snap, uh, snap at someone or get angry, and then it's over. This is just the ongoing, I mean, every time I see that person, I'm just, you know, we, we sometimes use the expression, if looks could kill, and, you know, you're just giving that person a dirty look, and I can't stand him, and, you know, you can't say anything nice about this person because you got that grudge. That's the idea here with resentment. And then, of course, there's righteous indignation, which is, Obviously not wrong. You see this many times in Scripture. Psalm 7, verse 11 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. Now, God gets upset when folks are wicked. Matthew 21, 12 and 13, Jesus goes into the temple and he cleanses the temple and he was upset because they turned it into a house of merchandise. The, the temple that was supposed to be there for worshiping and serving God and they turned it into a house of merchandise. He's upset. Mark 3, 1 to 5, and Jesus is upset there. In fact, it says in verse 5, he looked round about on them with anger being grieved for the hardness of their hearts. He, he's upset because they won't believe. It's not that they, they can't. It's not that they don't know. They just refuse. And, and that upset him in, in a righteously indignant kind of way. Uh, rage and resentment are interesting also because when you look at the, the Greek words, there is, uh, there's, there's the, let me see if I can remember which one is which. Rage is thumos. That's the quick, explosive anger. Then there is resentment or, or holding a grudge, which will be orge in the Greek. And I, I believe we've talked about this before. But it's interesting because you see them sometimes put together in passages. Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 31, Colossians 3, 8, use those words together. Anger, wrath, wrath, anger. It's, it's transposed from one to the other. But it's those two Greek words, and Paul is saying, stay away from, you know, learn to control your temper so you don't get angry and just snap at someone but also stay away from that resentment that holds a grudge as well. And this can be in a righteously indignant kind of way. In fact, uh, there's three different verses there. I believe they're on the handout as well. Revelation 14, verse 10 is the first one. Listen to what it says here. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, wrath, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. The wine of the wrath of God. The cup of his indignation. Two words there. Orge and thumos. In other words, in the day of judgment, when there is a judgment coming, it, it, you, you, you talk about frightening to think about and sobering. To think of God who is in his patience, in his long suffering, is giving opportunity to repent, and opportunity to repent, and opportunity upon opportunity. And then finally... Time is up, and the wrath of God is released, and it is stored wrath where God has been patiently trying to bring folks to repentance. I often think of it as, as a parent, and if you have children, you understand what that's like. You're, you're saying, stop doing that. I don't want to punish you, but if you don't stop doing that, I'm going to. And, and you may even give several warnings, and then finally it's too late. I remember when Joshua was just about two years old. We were living in Ringgold. He loved to get on this stool that we had. He would use that to access the counter, and he would use that to access whatever, pretty much anything else in the kitchen. And so he knew that was wrong, and he was old enough to understand that, and so oftentimes we'd say, stop climbing on that. Get down. Get down. And he'd, he'd kind of look at you like, is it, you know, I'm getting close. And, and then by the time you stand up, Boom, he comes down. But it's too late then. And there's just going to be punishment because, you know, the warning, warning. That's the idea. Uh, another verse, Revelation 
four, uh, 16, 19. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Those same two words, and you see it again in Revelation 19, 15, where it talks about treading the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Three different kinds of, or three different classifications, I guess we could say, of wrath. And, and Jesus, over and over again, he, he's saying in this, this verse 22, it's not just the words, it's the spirit in which they're used. Watch our attitudes toward people. There are those who are fools. In fact, Psalm 14, 1, the fool said in his heart, there is no God. But, but for me, just to look at a brother and say, you know, you, you fool, that's like calling someone a morally corrupt, morally depraved person. Obviously, that's, there's an attitude problem there. So we need to be careful about our attitudes. And then he talks about in verses 23 to 26, a favorable reconciliation. He says, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has ought against you, leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. Well, you know, the priority of reconciliation. It, it's amazing here. I've, I've often pointed out this is the only time in Scripture where God says, don't go to worship. And that's if you have something between you and your brother. And he doesn't say, you know what, he, he, he's wronged you. Uh, you know, you, you wait for him to come to you. He says, go, go to him. One of the hardest commands to carry out. It's difficult. I think we would all agree with that. But he says, if you have all against your brother, don't wait for him to come to you. You go. You leave your gift. You go be reconciled. Then you come and worship. You see the priority of reconciliation? And then he talks about the urgency of reconciliation. Look at verses 25 and 26. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Well, we can make a lot of comments about this from, from the context of the first century, but basically just summing it up is, this is important. I mean, just making the point that you need to do this yesterday. You know, we sometimes use that expression. You know, I want this done and I want it done yesterday. That's what Jesus is saying. You got something between you and your brother in Christ, you need to take care of that yesterday. That's what he's getting at. Uh, not worrying about, you know, going to court or anything like that. You know, he says, settle out of court. Just make peace with your brother. Because this is an important matter. A very, very important matter. So you see a favorable reconciliation to this dispute. Jesus is dealing with disputes. It's not just a judicial matter of don't kill somebody. You can hate them. You, you can, as we sometimes say, hate their guts. But, you know, as long as you don't raise a hand and strike them or kill them, no big deal. That was kind of the Pharisees' mentality. Jesus says, no, citizens of the kingdom of Christ go beyond that. They understand the spirit of this law, and that is you love your brother. And if you've got a dispute with your brother, take care of it. Let's go on and talk about the next section here, and that is dealing with desires. Verse, verses 27 through 30. Notice he's going to talk, first of all, here about a deceitful display of these Pharisees uh, and, and scribes and some of those religious leaders. He says, you have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Was that said of old time? Yes. One of, the, one of the Ten Commandments, right? But again, they insist on the external obedience. I, I mean, in fact, in one occasion, what happens in John chapter 8? They bring this woman. Now, I don't know. They conveniently neglected to bring the man, but they said, look, we caught her in the very act. And, and they were upset because she had committed adultery. Well, they insisted on that external obedience, but they ignored the internal disobedience. They, they just, they, they weren't worried about that. It, it, it reminds us of Matthew 23. If you hold your spot there in Matthew 5, look at Matthew 23. I mean, this is, it's almost as if you, you could put these two passages together. It's in a different context. This is uh, in the week leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. But he, he calls it like it is with these folks. And he says, beginning there at verse 25 of Matthew 23, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, 
that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're likened to whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. I saw a video on, uh, I think it was on YouTube. I don't know, it's been a few weeks ago, I guess. But it was some lady that was, she was seriously upset. And <laughs> when you watch the video, you understand why. I had this little pack of Capri Sun. And, uh, you know, all nice looking and everything on the outside. And she, she cut it open and poured it into a, a plastic Tupperware looking container. And it had molded or something. It was well within the expiration date. I don't know what happened. I don't know what causes that. But she was just utterly disgusted because uh, her child had said it tasted funny or something. So they, they poured out and it was just moldy and nasty. Now, Jesus says that's what these scribes and Pharisees, that's what they're like. You know, everything looks okay on the outside. But inside, rotten to the core. They, they, again, they reduce this, this idea of thou shalt not commit adultery just to the physical act. Oh, you know, looking, looking on a woman with lust and having evil, wicked, corrupt thoughts, no big deal in their eyes. Long as you keep up those appearances. That's what they were obsessed with. You see this over and over again, especially right here in Matthew chapter 5 where Jesus is dealing with these things. So it's that deceitful display. Then he talks about the, the lustful look, verse 28. Notice what he says, But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Second Corinthians 10, 5, Paul talks about bringing every thought into captivity. I believe, I, well, I think I can say I know. That is probably the hardest thing to do as a child of God, is to bring every single thought into captivity to my Lord. It's difficult because sometimes we get upset. Sometimes we, uh, we lose our tempers, as we already talked about with disputes. We live in a world that is constantly tempting folks with sexual imagery and things like that. And so it's difficult. Job says, Job 31, verse 1, I made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a maid? We need to make a covenant with our eyes that we are going to refrain from the physical act of adultery, but also from the very thought. David said, Psalm 100, verse 3, uh, or I think it's might be 101, verse 3, uh, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Let's make sure we stay away from that kind of thing because the Pharisees had the idea, well, as long as you're not committing that physical act. Jesus says no. And you know, that, that's still true today. There are folks men or women, that they, they could proudly say, you know, I've never cheated on my spouse. But then the thoughts, sometimes into pornography and things like that, let's bring every thought into captivity and understand that adultery begins in the heart. And that brings us to the next part. Jesus, it's, it's no coincidence that in this discussion with desires, that he mentions what he mentions in verses 29 to 30, this painful process. He says, If thy right eye offend thee, plug it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not thy whole body should be cast into hell. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, cast it from thee. It's profitable that one of your members should perish, and not your whole body should be cast into hell. What's he saying here? Obviously, I don't think you need me to tell you. He's not saying literally pluck out your right eye, cut off your right hand. If you did that, if you had an eye filled with lust, or as Jude uses the expression, eyes full of adultery, if you had that problem and you plucked out your right eye, you'd just use your left eye to look at pornographic images or to look lustfully at women or, or men or whatever the case may be. So obviously that's not, the, that's not what he's saying here as a literal. If, if, if a person is a thief, you cut off the right hand, well, he could just, just deal with the left hand. You know, he's going learn to learn to you know, commit his crimes and sins with the left hand. So you know, there's, there's not a literal meaning here. What's he getting at? He's talking about the process of doing whatever it takes to bring yourself under the control of the Savior. Again, back to 2 Corinthians 10, 5, bring every thought into captivity. Here, here's, I don't submit to you this is every single step, but I think we could sum up this painful process that, again, there's a reason we call it a painful process. It's, it would be physically painful to pluck out your eye, to cut off your hand, but it's spiritually painful to go through this process of dying to self and living to the Lord because, it, well, it's a battle. 
It begins with a realization. It's a realization that it is going to be a battle. Romans 7, 14 to 25, Paul, people take that passage and do all kind of crazy things with it. Basically, Paul is just saying there, there's a battle going on inside of me. There are things that, that are fleshly desires that I know are not right. And so the spiritual side of me wants to follow God and wants to go to heaven is saying, you can't do those things. And this, the fleshly side is saying, oh, but that's pleasurable. That's going to feel good. We, we should do that. And so there's a battle going on inside each of us. Fleshly desires versus I want to serve the Lord. Understand this is a process. It's, it's a battle. And so there's a realization. Then there's the idea of subjugation. First Corinthians, in other words, bringing my, my body into subjection. Again, even to the very thoughts that I think. Second Corinthians 10, 5. But Paul says in First Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, he says, Know you not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things, self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I've preached to others, I myself should be cast away. Paul says, I'm keeping my body under control, self-control, so that I don't preach to others and become cast away. It's, it's understanding that this painful process, it begins with realizing this, it's a battle. But also, I've got to bring my self, even to the very thoughts that I think, into subjection to the Lord. And then there is a mortification. Colossians 3, 5 and 6, he, he talks about mortify, therefore, put to death your members which are upon the earth. And he goes on and mentions fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, uh, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. He says you've got to put to death fleshly desires. Now again, there's a reason why we say it's a painful process. It's a process. It's not going to happen all at once. We talked about this some studying Second Peter in our Bible class this morning. But that's part of the process. It's realizing, starting to bring myself into subjection, mortification, putting to death members that are on the earth. Well, this mortification process is, understand, it's intentional. Sin will never die out in your life on its own. If you leave it alone, it won't go away. Plant some kudzu in your yard and then decide you want to get rid of it and say, well, you know, if we just leave it alone, it'll go away, right? <laughs> Wrong. That stuff has to be killed. And, and many times it's very difficult to do. So is sin. It, it, this process is intentional. It's also gradual. Again, it, it, we're dying a little more to sin every day. You, you've, you've got to do a little bit at a time. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And so that's a gradual process. I'm gradually mortifying self, putting self to death, that I might follow my Lord. And then, of course, it's a spiritual process. It can only be accomplished in Christ Jesus. You can't, you, you can't do this aside from the Lord's help. Sin has three chains. We've, we've mentioned this before. There's love of sin. There's practice of sin. And, you know, a person may decide, I don't love sin anymore, and I'm not going to practice sin anymore. But, you know, some people, they just get too old to practice certain sin. And so they still love it. And that's why Jesus is dealing here with desires and thoughts. But there's love of sin, there's practice of sin, but there's one chain you can never break on your own, and that is the guilt of sin. Only Jesus Christ can do that. So this is an intentional process, gradual, spiritual. And then part, number four part of this process is starvation. I ran across this illustration. This, this is absolutely true. It says uh, there was an old Cherokee. He was talking to his grandson one evening about a battle going on inside of people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside all of us. One is evil. It's anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, pride, superiority, ego. The other one is good. It's joy, peace, love, serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, truth, compassion, and faith. The little boy thought for a minute and he asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? And the grandfather's response was, the one you feed. If you're going to complete this painful process of bringing every thought into captivity to the Lord, you're going to have to starve 
sin and the fleshly desires. That's how we put self to death. As we note on the conclusion of the handout there, at the, at the heart of the matter, Christianity is a matter of the heart. That's what Jesus is getting at here. God wants your heart. And when he has your heart, he'll have you. Does God have your heart this morning? Maybe you need to give him your heart in repentance. Come to Jesus, confess him as Lord. Submit yourself to being baptized into Christ to have your sins washed away as we read about over and over again in the book of Acts. Folks doing to become Christians. You can do that and be added by the Lord to his church, Acts 2.47. Maybe as a child of God, you need to come back to the Lord. You say, you know, the Lord doesn't have my heart and I want to make a change and make that right. Maybe you just need prayers for strength. God wants your heart. When he has your heart, he'll have the rest of you. And when we give him our hearts and we live our lives for him, we know that we're going to have that home in heaven with him when this life is over. Does God have your heart? If not, now's the time to make that right as we stand and sing to encourage you. Let us pray. 
Our dear, most almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for this day of life that thou hast blessed us with. We're so very thankful for all of your blessings that you've provided through your Son. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so very much for allowing us to be in this country in which we can worship and practice uh, Christianity in its, in, its, um, in its true form and without having persecution to, to come in between us and our Lord. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to uh, have your word and for it to guide our lives in manners of worship and, and moral conduct and uh, how we can better serve you and uh, ultimately please you to walk worthy of you to get into heaven as well through our obedience. Our dear Heavenly Father, please be with us this, this day. Help us to, uh, to constantly remember our attitudes and our character as we approach this life and as we approach others and as we approach eternity. Now these things go on in with us into eternity as well. Please be with us and keep us safe. Please forgive us of our sins. Christ, let me pray. Amen.